Welcome to another episode of the Your Longevity Blueprint podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Cody Kriegel. Dr. Kriegel never wants dental treatments to compromise your health and your ability to live every day as the best version of yourself. It's his passion to help you achieve optimal health with unique tailored biologic dental treatments. His philosophy centers around a non-toxic, minimally invasive, biocompatible approach. Your teeth are intimately connected to the rest of your body and understanding that intricacy and complexity of this relationship is fundamental. This is his craft and he trains diligently to find the best ways to improve the health and well-being of his clients. His desire is to help you see the impact your oral health can have on your well-being and empower you on your journey to optimal health. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kriegel. Hey, thank you for having me. This is awesome. Awesome, awesome. Just to remind my listeners early on, on show episode 18, the title was Healthy Mouth, Healthy Body. And so here I first interviewed Dr. Ben Plaspisil, who's my local dentist. And I encourage the listeners to go back and listen to that episode because my intent here today is that we echo what we already talked about, but then build upon that. So before we get to the good stuff, I wanna hear more about you, Dr. Kriegel. So tell me your story. What got you so passionate about changing the way you provide dental care? Yeah, you know, I think... um... For me personally, I've always been interested in health and wellness. It's always been a, a passion of mine. And as I went through dental school, through all of my education, I kind of, I didn't want to live a, a polarized life. I wanted to have my passions and my career be kind of married. And so um, I started down this path of looking into things myself, um, not just ingesting what you're told, but looking at all the cards on the table and literature reviews and things like that myself and found how incredibly important uh, the oral cavity is to overall health. Uh, And I'm a big believer that you can't have optimal health without uh, a healthy mouth. And so sometimes we get into these these discussions and a lot of people kind of have a a certain situation that led them down this path. And for me, it was a very close family member of mine where we, we did some treatment for her and we had some very interesting results happen. And so I started to take things a lot more seriously as far as optimal health. And, and here we are. It's been way more fun this way too. Well, now I want to ask about that. Are you comfortable sharing what the yeah. situation with Yeah, that? I will. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, she won't care. It's my mom. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, so, mom. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, mom. No, she, uh, she's okay. I tell her story all the time. Um, you know, I, I, I met a good friend and mentor of mine from Texas and basically we um, uh, kind of co-treated her together a little bit. Um, We removed some infections from her um, oral cavity and her heart palpitations that she had for years and years and years went away within a few weeks and we've gone and she had those for gosh, a long time, Um, all growing up for me. Um, And after we removed those, uh, we're going on, I think four years now with with no incidents and she used to have them, you know, two or three times a month. so that tipped my hat and said, hmm, what's yeah. going on here? Yeah. Awesome. 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 Well, we're just going to dig in. I, we should talk about infections, but I think before we get to infections, let's talk metal. Let's talk amalgam fillings, mercury. We're going to go there. So yeah. why is it important that someone has their amalgams removed safely? And actually, let me just back up. What are amalgam fillings? Tell the audience. Yeah. They may not know. They may be very, very familiar. I've had mine removed, but just tell us what they are and why you feel like they are dangerous and should be removed. Yeah, so uh, amalgam is one of many forms of metals that we classically have placed in people's mouths. And the teeth are kind of considered outside body. Um, they're not inside body in a sense. And mm-hmm. so we, and sometimes things are, people get away with things like that because we're not putting them inside body even though we put things inside people's bodies all the time, right? But um, amalgam uh, particularly is a, um, it's an alloy of a mixture of metals um, mercury, zinc, copper, tin, there's a lot of different metals in a mixture, um, in amalgam. Um, mm-hmm. it's kind of a civil war technology is what I say. And so the idea that we still use it, I think is a little bit baffling, but, um, they're predominantly about 50% mercury by weight. Um, uh, mercury has been coined as one of the most neurotoxic substances on the planet. We all know that from a lot of different ways, shapes, and forms. Um, um, and it's been used as a filling material for a very, very long time. Uh, today, um, I always say I get to benefit from being in today's world, but we have a much um, better, um, we have much better materials nowadays to be able to use. Um, and once we've known now, and we have a lot of literature to support the dangers of uh, that, that can come with amalgam um, restorations for some, for some individuals, uh, we don't use that material anymore. We, 
you say we don't use that. I do think some dentists still use that material. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, I meant in my <laughs> office, in my <laughs> clinic. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's it's still used quite a bit. It's an interesting kind of. Um, it's, it's frustrating, you know, it's subsidized by, by the government, you know, so we get, it's easy to use, it's cheap, it's yep. readily available, you know, those type of things. And it doesn't take a lot of skill, I'd argue to say it takes no skill to place. Um, and so it's, there's a lot of, um, you can call them benefits to the use of it, but I think we're better than that now. And so mm -hmm. um, I think we need to do better. Well, it takes more skill to remove, which we'll get to, but I want to go back to the neurotoxic effects that you said mercury has. So I think our, uh, we're in agreement on how bad mercury can be, like literally putting it in our, in our bodies. So my stance on that is every time you chew, I remember hearing through my fellowship program, through American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, Medicine, they talked about, I mean, there's a whole module on heavy metals and how bad they are for us. And one major source is the metals in our mouth. Every time you chew, you're releasing mercury vapors. So even if you're not even currently still having metal fillings placed in your mouth, the old fillings that are there over the course of days and weeks and years and decades, right? Are still releasing those mercury vapors when you chew. Do you agree with that? Wholeheartedly. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, they, they do off gas 24 seven. We've known that for some time. It's not like it's a news, a news break, a news flash in any way, shape or form. Uh, they will off gas more with attrition. Um, so as you're chewing, um, as you're brushing, those type of things and uh, with temperature changes. So if you're drinking like a hot coffee or something like that, they will off gas a little bit more. And that vapor um, it's very insidious. It knows no barrier is what I say. So it can cross a lot of the barriers that we have built into our body um, to be able to defend ourselves. Um, so that's where it gets to be a little bit alarming as well. And we also know the mouth is one of the entrances to the body, but yes. uh, the most used, I will say. And it, as we pass food and things through that, you know, that all goes down into our digestive tract. And so we, we have to be you know, cognizant of whatever we're putting in somebody's mouth will have some strong effects down the rest of the system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to go back again, just to that, that concept that these metals in our mouth can be neurotoxic. So that means they can be damaging to our, not just our nervous system, but certainly our nervous system. So I have had patients who've had dizziness, headaches, tremors, different paresthesias, which are really just impaired sensations. So patients can feel like they have, you know, pins and needles. Um, patients can have muscle weakness, twitching. They can even have emotional changes, right? Mood swings, anxiety. So having these mercury vapors in your mouth, you know, certainly, like you mentioned, can affect multiple organ systems in our bodies, specifically our nerves. And even back to your mother's palpitations, I would imagine the mercury for one patient could even cause palpitations, right? So they're not, yeah. this is not something that you really want to have in your mouth. And if you're listening right now for the first time and you're wondering, well, what do I do about these? Because I already have them in my mouth. <laughs> we're going to get to that. So we're going to talk about how uh, Dr. Pringle is different because he has a different protocol that he follows for removal. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and how your office is different and what your approach is to safe removal of these? For sure. Yeah. And going back to what you said really quickly about yeah. all the different ways or symptoms that people can get, yes. you know, there's a plethora of them that um, our body only has so many ways to show something is wrong. Right. right. And so um, I always encourage people um, to know that, you know, and then we'll probably come back to it again later, but there's a bio individuality at play. Some people can tolerate things to a certain extent and some people can't yep. tolerate them at all. Yep. My classic analogy is, you know, we have the woman on the nightly news that is 110. And when they ask her her key to her long, long life, she says, you know, uh, Dr. Pepper and a pack of cigarettes every day. And th those Which types is of not people, good advice. But no, <laughs> not at all. And she didn't live to 110 doing that. I, I might argue she might live to 120 if she didn't. But uh, but what I'm saying is, is there's an individuality at play that some people, like you you know the detox system very, very well. Some people, is, they can't get those things out of the system as easily. So then they start to have some symptoms, whether it's totally. early on or years down the road. Totally. And we can look for that. And that's the topic of chapter three in my book is really looking at our genetics, because some of us can remove toxins much more easily than others. I did not win the genetic lottery in regards to toxin removal. I need to be eating organic. I need to be taking glutathione. There are things that I need to be more aggressive at doing than my husband who did almost win the genetic lottery. You know, you know we do have different things. Yes, oh. yes. It's just not fair. No. Um, so let's go back to the protocol for removal. So tell us more about how you remove these safely in your office. 
Yeah. So uh, we use the SMART protocol, so Safe Mercury Amalgam Removal Technique. It's been published by uh, an organization called the IAOMT, so International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. And for any listeners, I would encourage you to hop on their website. They've kind of pulled a lot of the literature. They even have some good um, educational videos, things like that, in relationship to amalgam um, fluoride or these different things that can be used um, that are used in dentistry a lot. And even just other materials, like we'll talk about metals in general, I'm sure, but even just materials in general and a way to approach and what that looks like. Um, but they've developed something called the SMART protocol, um, which is a bit a way to basically mitigate and eliminate exposure to, um, to the mercury content in amalgam during removal. So uh, when you understand what th these uh, restorations are composed of, that doesn't mean then you want to grind them all out and let them go all over the place and let people ingest it and things like that. Cause that just, more harm in the process. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And I encourage people, I say, hey, if you're unable to have them removed and you feel like you want to do that, again, informed consent, we want to make sure everybody's making a decision for themselves. But if you are, you know, feel that you want to have yours removed, um, I, I always encourage people to do it safely. Don't do it unsafely. It's better to leave them in there until you're able to remove them safely. Mm -hmm. um, you could exacerbate some issues that you may be having. Um, I totally agree. Yep. Yeah. So that's the protocol that I had to remove mine. And I will say, I didn't have many to remove, thankfully, but they're, they're out. Uh, I will say part of that protocol, I, I think maybe you can speak to this, is not removing like them all at once either. Right. So would you do, do one quadrant at a time or like how slowly do you remove them? Yeah, good question. You know, I take into consideration kind of a patient's like whole health when I kind of am looking at that, too. Are they able to withstand something like that? You know, we see the patient population. We see a lot as people after one optimal health, people that are sick or sometimes even athletes that want to improve their optimal health and things like that. And so uh, we're kind of looking at it in, in context. I, I think that's a little bit debated and I, and I don't know, I, I don't remove them all at once. I will do it by quadrant. So yep. top or bottom, left or right, that type of thing, or by side of the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the approach that we take. Uh, sometimes the, the patient will dictate kind of how that's best if it needs to be done one or two at a time or something like that. But sure. um, that's kind of the approach that, that we take. Yeah, it's usually quadrant or by the side, side of the mouth. And can you, can you dive in a little further with the SMART protocol? So like for a patient who's listening, they're like, okay, so it sounds smart. It's a SMART protocol, but like, how is that different from them going to the regular dentist and just having the, the fillings removed? Just kind of briefly explain how you yeah. do that. Yeah, that's a great acronym. I've, I've, I need to shake the hand of one of the guys in the IOMT that made that. <laughs> I think because I it is that, smart. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it's just, it's a multifold layers of protection. So again, when we're removing something that has uh, those contents in it, we want to mitigate exposure as much as possible. And truth be told, it started a little bit from a selfish standpoint. Once I learned about them, you know, being human nature, I, I thought, oh, I want to protect myself. Like, I, you know, dentists yeah. are known for neurological issues. They're yeah. known for things like that later in life. And it's no coincidence when they've been handling it physically in hand or or, um, you know, intoxicating themselves in yeah. a sense um, yeah. by doing this their whole career. Uh, and then I started to think, wait, I want to protect also my staff, uh, my patients, um, mm -hmm. you know, all, everybody. So what we do is it's a, we drape the patient. So we use an impermeable barrier. Um, we're using a rubber dam, which kind of acts as a little like, um, oh, kind of like a gasket where it's kind of separating the patient from their teeth in a sense is how I look at it. And that serves as a catch to make sure that none of that goes down the back of a patient's throat or anything like that. Um, we're using a, a nasal source um, and kind of covering a patient's face, making sure that's all covered. Uh, Pre-rinsing and post-rinsing with certain metal binders or things to get down into the GI tract so that in yep. case something gets past the, um, we use a product by Quicksilver called IMD, but it's basically we're putting something in the GI tract. So if something gets by any of our catches, there's a strong binder at the, you know, into in the track to bind it and push it through. Yeah. Uh, and are you all like dressed up in what looks like hazmat suits? Like, are you all <laughs> yeah. protected? Yeah, we, we use, uh, yeah. So we use um, disposable gowns. Um, of course, we're using a, a mercury, uh, a mask that has a mercury um, uh, vapor uh, content in it that we want to protect ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, we're also using the, one of the biggest things I think is too, is the, uh, the at source suction. So like an aerosol. Yes, so when these things are yes. vapor, giving off a vapor, right? We have that sitting right by the patient's chin um, to make sure that that pulls about 90, over 99% of the vapors in and of itself. 
Awesome. Um, so we're filtering that as well, just like the filters that are on, you know, ourselves and things like that. My staff, everybody's wearing that type of thing in there. So wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so obviously, what you do is better, safer, smarter. <laughs> That's what I recommend for my patients. So I do want to get to fluoride. You mentioned fluoride. I think I want to dive into root canals next, though. We haven't talked about yeah. root canals on the show at all. So can you explain what a root canal is? Why do dentists place them? Like, should we really ever get one? And if we've had one, should they be removed? And how so? So there are a lot of questions there, but let's first maybe have you define what a root canal is. Like, why are they placed? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the way I talk to my patients about it is as a tooth is an organ, um, an organ by nature. So it has multiple tissues. Um, and on the inside, we have enamel and dentin and things like that. Most people have heard of those things. On the inside of a tooth is what we call the pulp. And the pulp is composed of uh, a blood supply, a lymphatic system, an autonomic nervous system. So it's actually the, the apex or the terminus of the cranial nerve five, a trigeminal nerve, which is a very important uh, cranial nerve. They're all important, um, but I'd argue this one's very, very important. Um, and so when we do a root canal, we remove all of those things. Um, and a root canal can be deemed appropriate for a lot of different reasons, but typically it's because of a bacterial infiltration or infection of the nerve. Um, when teeth get infected, uh, they can go, it's a very dichotomous situation. It can go one of two ways. It can either get really, really painful or it can have no pain at all. Um, and so that's an interesting concept with teeth, um, first and foremost. But when we do a root canal, we then remove those contents. So we remove the blood supply, the lymphatics, the autonomic nervous system, and then we render the tooth as now a non-vital or a dead organ. Um, and one thing, you know, along my path and in, in these things, there's always a pause for thought moments is what I call them, where yeah. I, it makes you stop and think a second, um, kind of take a 10,000 foot view. And when realizing that dentistry is the only branch of medicine that feels it's okay to leave a dead organ in the system is, is a pause for thought moment for me. Totally. Now, yeah. We never make a, anybody not have a root canal. I'm a big, like I said before, a big believer in informed consent. I think that people need to know all sides of what's going on, the, the possible systemic health effects that can come with um, root canal treated teeth. Um, they need to have all those cards on the table to still make a decision that they feel is best for themselves. That's first and foremost important. We have patients choose to get a root canal all the time, and I send them to the best endodontist or specialist that I know. Um, and I think they have to be done by a specialist when they're done. I don't think a general practitioner by and large should be doing those procedures. At the end of the day, a lot of our patients don't do a root canal. They prefer not to do a root canal. Um, and so we will remove that tooth, remove the infection, and then there's some replacement options that can come with that. In our clinic, it's almost always a ceramic implant um, to replace that from, from a biological and an optimal health point of view. I want to I rewind. I want to talk about those ceramic implants. But so can many times, can you save the teeth? Like if, if the underlying cause of the need for the root canal is infection, can you, is there any like ozone? Is there anything that you can use to try to save the tooth? Yeah, yeah, and we're actually getting a lot further. That's an interesting topic. I, we're, as we advance, dentistry, just like medicine, but it advances by the minute. And so yeah. I feel very strongly if you don't keep up, uh, you'll get left behind pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, it depends on a little bit of how far along that bacterial infiltration is happening within sure. the tooth, for sure. Um, there's a lot of different therapies out there that, uh, that can be used. Ozone is one, and that's used in every facet, at least of our clinic and some other clinics out there. Yeah. Um, there's some vital pulp therapies. There's some different ways to utilize um, what's called PRF or platelet rich fibrin, which is fabricated from, um, we use that in all of our surgeries as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's like, I call it Harry Potter magic. The stuff is incredible. But what you do is you take a couple of vials of blood from a patient share side, you spend it in a centrifuge, you extract growth factors and membranes like that. And you can utilize those growth factors in a, a couple percent stem cell using that down inside the pulp of the tooth to try to regenerate the nerve. Um, yeah, cool. That's proving to be something new uh, and exciting out there. Cause the idea at the end of the day is a healthy tooth is the best. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big believer that God made teeth the best and whatever we do is secondary to that at most. And so um, between that and lasers are also coming onto the, onto the catch pretty good and utilizing photobiomodulation and low, low level laser therapies for that is, is you know, there's some interesting stuff going on with that as well. Very progressive. Well, we'll have to have you back on the show in a couple of years when you're doing all that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. If for, yeah. For now, for patients like myself um, who have had a root canal, 
how do you recommend they be safely removed? I think a lot of dentists just say, don't touch them, leave them put. Like, what is your philosophy on who is a candidate for removal and then like how you remove them? For sure. Yeah. So uh, in our, in our clinic, it's standard of care that a new patient always gets a cone beam. So we want to investigate what does that root canal look like first and foremost. At the end of the day, it's always a patient's decision on if they want to have a tooth removed, we can do that. Again, with informed consent, talking about what that looks like, the replacement options, if that's in alignment with who they are and their values, uh, of course. Um, but we routinely find um, infected root canal teeth or, or infected non-root canal teeth on a cone beam every day, sometimes two, three, explain, or four in people's mouths. Explain yeah. what that cone beam is because patients or listeners. Yeah. 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 A cone beam is a, um, a CBCT or cone beam is another term for it, but it's basically a three-dimensional rendering of your, of your jaws, of your mandible and your maxilla, your top and lower jaw. Um, and we can look at not only your teeth, but we look at everything in cross-section down to a handful of micrometers. And we can look at the tooth inside the bone, the roots, where are your nerves, where is your sinus, you know, where are your vital structures. So when we go in to do a surgery on a patient, we know how close are we to those vital structures and basically to stay the heck away from them. Um, sure. I think, again, I get to benefit from that technology nowadays, but if I was doing surgery, you know, 20 years ago, knowing what I know now, it would have been crazy to not know where things are at when you're doing that for a patient. Um, and those, those are all vital structures that in some people, um, everybody's very much the same, but drastically different. I mean, they all have a nerve, but is it high? Is it low? Is it near or far? Those type of things. So, but when we're evalu evaluating root canals, we're kind of looking at the surrounding structures first and foremost, and then seeing is that root canal does it have a apical, um, uh, an infection on the end of the root? Um, and classically, we see that quite a bit. So do you, ever, is, do you ever not see it? Like sometimes do you say, well, oh, this one's okay. We'll leave it alone. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. I show yeah. every patient the root canal yeah. right away. I show it on a big screen in front of them so they can't miss it. If their tooth is as big as their head. I'm like making it as clear as day. And yeah, we do see some that don't have an apical infect or an infection on the end of the root apex at the end of the root. We do see those um, for sure. The hard part with that is, is I will then tell people that we have removed um, a lot of different teeth, uh, root filled or not root filled, or you know, a root canal or non root canal tooth. And even uh, we've had a couple of patients that have had some uh, systemic health decline immediately after having a root canal tooth. And so for those patients, they want to have it out. And so when we remove that tooth, even if it looks like it's normal, I will send those in to get a kind of a pathology report or report and say, what's inside this tooth? I've never had one come back clean. Even the ones that show no infection, we know that a root canal mm -hmm. without an immune system, you know, is a cave for kind of bad bacteria and things. And bacteria are one thing, their toxins or biotoxins are another whole concept there as well. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so is there any trick to safely removing root canals? Yeah, I think there's a lot of tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, it, there's a protocol that we kind of employ whenever we're doing anything, just like a smart protocol for amalgam removal. When we remove a tooth, it starts with kind of saying, okay, what's the patient, what is their systemic health? You know, that's to be taken into large consideration. Is somebody able to go through something like that? Or are they, do we need to kind of up their nutrition and things like that before they go through a surgery? Sure. Of course, if they have an acute infection, we don't have time to wait for something like that. But um, so I, and when we're looking at nutrition, it's a lot of looking at some of those things like vitamin D, K2, C, magnesium, kind of just having them pre-supplement to make sure that they're on board with that. Yeah, that's when we great. Remove it, yeah, when we remove a tooth, then it's, uh, it's atraumatic as possible. Um, sometimes that means taking the tooth out in one piece. Sometimes it's multiple pieces, but we want to make sure it's done atraumatically. And then we treat the site with ozone. We treat the site with laser. Um, and then we're usually using that PRF or blood concentrates made from the patient's blood to, to be able to heal and regenerate those areas. That's awesome. Um, I want to, maybe you've kind of already indirectly talked about this, but I want to talk about the, the, the firm cavitation. So you've mentioned that some of these root canals have infection. So is, essentially, is that what a cavitation is when there's like a pocket of infection underneath? Yeah, yeah. In a sense, yeah. Cavitation is kind of a term for... Um, it's a layman's term. You know, the, the pathological terms are chronic ischemic bone disease or fatty degenerative osteonecrosis of the jawbone. 
FDOJ. Of course, in dentistry and medicine, we have to have these big, long, fancy terms because it makes us sound smart and cool and like we know what we're talking about, right? Um, but, uh, but cavitations are kind of a, something that can happen after a tooth has been removed. And sometimes they've been found around a, around a root canal as well. Uh, it's kind of an, an, a low grade, silent kind of chronic um, inflammatory issue going on inside the bone. There's a lot of reasons why it can happen. Um, so you can kind of keep an eye out for those for people as well. And so when you're removing the root canal, you're obviously assessing for infection and afterwards you're sending the tooth in as well, but you're, you're basically like spraying ozone down in that, that pocket or whatnot. <laughs> and then you're saying you would then put a ceramic implant on, I mean, to, to replace the tooth. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So when we were, we're injecting kind of an ozone gas, it's called ozone fumigation into the site. We let the site, you know, that's, that's, uh, there's a lot of reasons that we're using ozone. We use it in just simple cavities or simple restorations. We use it in our um, tooth cleanings and things like that. Um, and then in this site, we're using it to kind of clean and help disinfect the site. Also um, bring more blood flow to the site because we know that's the source of healing. Um, and then we're put, putting in PRF. And if, if a ceramic implant is the choice that somebody has made to be able to replace that tooth, then we're looking at whether we can do that the same day, which is always the most ideal if we can, or letting the site heal and then returning at a future date after things have healed. Um, and that sometimes is also dependent on a patient's vitamin D status. If they have a low vitamin D status, we know that that's going to be tough to heal. And that could cause an, a failure of in, an implant just from a, from a bone health point of view. So if they have a low vitamin D, I'm not going to be putting in an implant. We're going to be waiting until they can up that. Yeah, awesome. So is ceramic your choice replacement? I mean, is, or for the tooth, or are there other options that you offer in your office? Yeah, yeah. So whenever it's an implant, which is usually the best option, but not always. I'm never a, uh, I don't always make that choice based on everybody, right? It's to kind of patient dependent or situation dependent. But most of the time, a ceramic implant is the best option. Um, and we only utilize ceramic in our practice. We don't utilize titanium or other metal implants anymore. Um, other options, we can have a fixed dental bridge, which is kind of a, that involves the two neighboring teeth. So we don't like to do that if those are virgin teeth or they're, you know, uh, pretty close to being virgin teeth. Um, there's also some removable options as well, kind of like a little tooth with a, or a retainer with a tooth on it or things like that, that can work as well. Um, if somebody is very sick, if they have a, a autoimmune diseases that are affecting them and they're kind of debilitated, we're not going to challenge their immune system with, um, with an implant or something like that. We're going to be looking at some different options for them. Sure, sure. Wise. Okay, let's transition to fluoride. Want to talk about fluoride? Yeah. Do you use it in your office or no? <laughs> we do not use fluoride in our office. Yeah. It, fluoride's an interesting one. You know, um, it's a halogen. It's a very reactive compound. Um, and again, 10,000 foot view or pause for thought moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Decay is not the lack of fluoride. And fluoride hasn't, we haven't been using it in the mm -hmm. grand scheme for a long time. Decay mm -hmm. is a man-made disease. Um, it's interesting that we only find that, that we, 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 what I kind of say is we put these things like they're golden calves. We cling to these things and we'll, we'll, we'll look, we won't look at, it's a confirmation bias. We won't look at certain reports or literature that, that um, is not in support of it. And, so, and I think that's what's happening sometimes. We know that fluoride being a reactive component um, has a lot of affinities for a lot of things in the, in, in the human body. It can have issues with the pineal gland, bones. Thyroid is a big one because it's so yeah. close. Right. You know, very much, you know, very well about that. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of health issues that that uh, or at least there's there's some neurotoxicity issues with it as well. So there's a lot of things going with fluoride that are um, at least pause for thoughts, in my opinion. So instead of using fluoride, how do you improve my like, oral health in general? You've already alluded to some nutrition, but for the audience, give them some take homes. Like what are what are better alternatives? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And again, going back to Decay, it's, it's what's the root cause, right? Is it that you have some salivary issues, right? If you're on a lot of medications, um, is it diet? A lot of times it's diet. If we're, if we're not eating the right foods and things like that, right? We can't absorb minerals in our gut. Vitamin D, if that's not high, we're not gonna be able to mineralize those structures, right? It, such as teeth and bones, those type of things. There's a lot going on there. And we see, we do see some gluten intolerant issues as well. So sometimes you can kind of look in the mouth and, and you kind of have that conversation with somebody and ask them about gluten. I'm not a really big fan of gluten. Most people aren't. Uh, but if we if we have a gluten intolerant patient and they have all that inflammation going on in their gut, of course, they're going to have an issue with mineralization of their teeth as well. 
Okay. Um, I was going to, I've never really talked about that, the association between gluten sensitivity or even celiac and oral health. But, but I imagine, of course, if your gut's inflamed, your mouth can be inflamed. And then if you're not absorbing nutrients, that's going to impact, you know, your, yeah, your, for sure. Your structure. Even, so it makes sense. I've just never health, thought about yeah, that. It, yeah. From a health point of view too, just like periodontitis, right? Um, another way of looking at that is leaky gum. You know, I'll play on the words with the leaky gut. It's the same thing. Uh, yeah. We have a breakdown in barrier. We have food passing, um, you know, past those barriers. You know, a tooth, going back to it being an organ, it's an interesting organ because it spans inside, outside body. Yeah. Right? It spans, it's, it goes down inside the bone and then it goes up and out and is barraged with, you know, pH changes over 800 species of bacteria, virus, all kinds of things in the mouth. It's kind of a trash can, to be honest with you. Uh, so that oral microbiome. So it's an interesting, interesting thing there. Going back to, to other things outside of fluoride, you know, we're yeah, big fans yeah. of hydroxyapatite at our, at our clinic. Um, that's the mineral found naturally in your teeth. And we have a lot of um, toothpaste out there that use hydroxyapatite. Um, they're clean toothpaste, so they don't have a lot of other things in them, we'll say. Um, and that's been proven um, in multiple studies to be as good at remineralizing or better than fluoride. And you can drink the whole tube and nothing will happen to you. And that's one of the pause with that moments with fluoride. Well, well, I have a, yeah, good point. But I do have a question on that. I mean, just to play devil's advocate. So do yeah. those have dairy in them then? Like, good question. Yeah. So another yeah. option that sometimes we'll employ. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're getting For at. For patients yeah, who have dairy allergy or, I mean, sure. not, there's a small amount in the, the paste or whatnot, but like, yeah, for patients yeah really not in the hydroxyapatite paste, or at okay. least the ones that we that we kind of are fans of. Risewell is one of them. Okay. Um, uh, MI paste is another another paste that we use. It's minimal intervention paste. Uh, it has okay. calcium phosphate in it. That works very, very well for mineralization as well. But it does have some casein in it. So that's awesome. Yeah. There. Yeah. So MI paste, we're kind of whenever we employ that for a patient, it's always caveat. Do you have a dairy allergy? And if you're, or do you yep. know of one? And yeah. So. Sure, sure. Wonderful. So it sounds like you are very progressive and I, I'm with you. I want to stay ahead of the game. I don't want to be left behind here in my field. So why don't other dentists, I mean, I know we're kind of younger, so we have, we have a lot of our career left, right? Why do some even older dentists maybe not recognize this way of doing dentistry? Like, what do you think the pushback is? Yeah, I'll be the first one to say it. I can't speak for others, but I can, I can theorize. I'll put it that way. I think, you know, Again, going back to that golden calf analogy, I think when we've used certain things for a long time, our, then our response is, well, we've done it this way for so long and it's worked and you have to define work, right? It's worked, uh, then why would we change? And I think change is, is good in a lot of ways. Um, and so when, uh, I think that's a, and it's, it's a cognitive dissonance, you know, it's a challenge to a long held belief. And I think that's what had to happen with me for me to be kind of pushed past that is I had to say, wait, hold on what are these people saying about fluoride in it being bad, right? What are these people saying about amalgam that might not be good for some people, right? What, what are the, instead of um, putting it down, I want to know that I want to have that open dialogue and investigate it myself. And I think that's where sometimes we get into those old dog old tricks or those things that we just ingest what we're told and then do it. And, we and it's don't easier to just it. turn an eye and keep on doing it than to <laughs> much easier. Never is the path of least resistance, the easiest uh, or the best way. I shouldn't say never most of the time. I'll say that. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. So you are a biologic dentist. Is that what you call yourself? Biologic dentist. So Correct. What, what exactly is that? I probably should have opened and asked you that as the first question, but we'll just keep asking away here. So how does that make you different? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the things that we've talked about are kind of what would make us a little bit different. We're kind of sure. coming from a perspective of optimal health. So we want to yes. use things that aren't a challenge into the immune system. Um, we want to use products, like I said, that aren't challenging the immune system, um, filling materials, um, surgical interventions, those type of things. We're kind of always looking at the, the body as how can we either not tread on the body's um, system or improve upon it. And yeah. so we're kind of looking at that and systemic health as well with all of our um, treatments and things like that. Um, and that's, I think that's important. You know, when we look at people's health histories and we see a lot of things going on. And today you see people on 20, 30 Medicaid, it can be mind numbing, you know, but then there's a tip off there where, you know, for example, like a root canal treated tooth, if somebody has a lot of heart disease, coronary artery, if they have a history of heart, heart issues or cardiovascular issues, we have to be very cognizant of that when having that discussion about what they should do. You know, there's a lot of literature there. And so I think, you know, we have to, never should medicine and dentistry have split. We should have always been together. 
Um, and I hope that by the time my career is over with, we can make that relationship kind of more synergistic again, the way it should be. Mm, love that. I didn't get to x-rays. What about x-rays? Do you feel like x-rays are a useful tool? Is that something that you utilize? Uh, I know a lot of patients don't want more radiation right in their mouth, but what are your thoughts yeah. on x-rays? Yeah, you know, we have to follow a principle of as low as, you know, reasonably possible for sure. So we don't want to go overboard with them. Um, at the same time, if we miss something, that's only detrimental to a patient. And, mm -hmm. and so we, we want to take what we need, but nothing, nothing more. And again, we're improving upon that in the digital era. Um, but at the same time, for patients that have some issues with that, I'm always kind of looking at, hey, why don't we support your system before and after with, you know, vitamin C, something that's going to mm -hmm. kind of help with that redox or things like that. Um, you know, there's are some homeopathics that some patients have used in the past. I've seen that they'll bring them in and use them. So we're always just supporting people and whatever they feel is best for themselves. And I know you removed the root canal, one of my staff members, and thankfully we offer IV vitamin C here at our clinic. So yeah. the day before her surgery, she got her IV vitamin C. She had surgery with you. The next day we gave her IV vitamin C again. So I'm on, on board with that. I think, yeah, the more we can support our patients just from a nutritional standpoint, the better outcomes they're going to have period. So Oh man, I, to, to your point there, we, we see such good healing using IV nutrition before and after uh, with, with patients with surgeries. It's, it's night and day different what we see. And I would love to make that just a main protocol that is always done. Um, can you imagine? Good. I mean, I love that you're offering that for, for the oral surgery, but can you imagine if we utilized IV nutrition for every surgery, like in every organ system in the body? Like my patients ask me, why don't hospitals like offer this like before and after surgery? And I don't have like a great answer for them other than it's an additional expense that insurance may not cover. But to your point, I think, I, yeah, I just think outcomes could be so much better and you're clearly seeing that in your practice. So I love yeah, that you're yeah. advising. I mean, again, and it's, it's, it's great to have people like you close by, you know, to, to be able to do that for people. Um, we don't do it in clinic right now, but we get, we try to work with other practitioners like you to yeah. get them to there to, to, to be able to have those things. And in, in, we've even seen, I mean, there's been a plethora of literature on vitamin C and just mitigating the effects of chemo for cancer yeah, patients. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, so it's, it's, it's a tough world out there. And I sometimes yeah. you have to read the lines a little bit. It's tough. Yeah, totally. Well, is there anything else that makes your practice different that you want to share with the audience today before we wrap up the show? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, again, coming from Optimal Health, I love innovation. Um, I think the biggest and newest thing that we're employing a lot is laser therapy. So I think that's really cool stuff. And and um, uh, it's fun, it's exciting. And I think as we continue down this path of, of looking for optimal health for people, um, dentistry will become more mainstream as to needed uh, to be able to get people healthy. You know, I think it's, it's crucial. Of course, I'm a little bit biased. I'll say that on the front end, but, uh, but I think it's, it's imperative that if you don't have a healthy mouth, it's impossible to have a healthy rest of your system. Mm -hmm. Totally agreed. So tell us your website, your social media channels, like where listeners can connect with you and find you. Yeah, yeah. So our website is Corridor Dental NL um, for NorthLiberty.com. Uh, it's kind of a long one. Uh, and I'm on Instagram. Uh, on I, I tend to not get on social media as much anymore. It's kind of uh, mind numbing a little bit, but I'm on Instagram primarily as Cody Kriegel DDS. Um, and that's more of a, just a kind of who I am behind the scenes, more of my family and things like that. Um, and sometimes I'll, I'll throw a few thoughts on what I think about certain things up there. But other than that, that's kind of where we're at on our platforms. And uh, it's exciting. It's, a, it's an interesting world out there right now. We're glad to have you here locally. So tell us lastly, what your longevity, top longevity tip is. You maybe have already mentioned it. But what's that's your top a, longevity a, tip? Yeah, that's a big one. Um, I'll tell you what has worked best for me. And I've used... I've done a lot. I like to practice on myself, put it that way. So I've done a lot of me things too. myself yeah. <laughs> um, before I, you know, tell people about them, that type of thing. And I'm always messing with different things and learning new things and applying them in my daily regimens. I'm a very protocol driven uh, man. Uh, but I think the one thing that for me um, and what I see from some of my patients as well, that over kind of transcends all of it is mindset. I think if you don't have a healthy mindset and a healthy mind, and that's irrespective of you know neurological issues. I mean, if you can't have a healthy mindset and a, and a drive that way, then you you won't be able to live long and live long. You know, live life to the fullest. I think you know some people don't get as long, but they've lived a lot more full 
yeah. than, uh, than other people's. And so I think having that mindset and especially in today's world where, where that can be taken from you quickly, you have to be very protective mm -hmm. of, I say protective of your vibe, protective of your energy, protective of uh, your mindset. And, and I think that's the key to people at least living full. I love that. Protective of your vibe. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much today, Dr. Kriegel, for coming on the show and sharing your passion to improve one's oral health, to improve their full body health. So I'm on board with that. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. My pleasure.